I am Jolie Mockaby, Chairman of the Yarmouth Historic Commission. I'm going to begin our meeting by taking a roll call for quorum. George Slama. Here. Melanie Barron. Here. Jack Duggan. Just sat down. Here he is. Kathy Hyslip. Here. Bob Kelly. Here. Beverly Bashan. Here. And Bob Hyslip. Here. All right. Uh, we have a quorum present. I'm going to turn the meeting over, um, call the meeting to order, and I'm going to ask our moderator, Grace, to explain how the remote participation will work before proceeding. Grace. Thanks, Julie. As a precautionary measure to reduce the spread of the coronavirus, all town buildings are closed to the public, and the May 13th, 2021 Historical Commission meeting will be held by remote participation. My name is Grace Rogers, and I'm the Office of Administrator for the Yarmouth Historical Commission, and will be serving as moderator for this virtual meeting. Although no in-person attendance will be permitted, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access and participate in the proceedings. Persons who would like to view or listen to this meeting will do so in progress by watching this virtual meeting or dialing into the number provided on the notice of meeting. We'll also post a recording of this meeting on the Town of Yarmouth website as soon as we are able to do so. Please be patient as we work to overcome any technological challenges within the virtual meeting. For all meetings to reduce the confusion during the meeting, all audience participants of the virtual meeting enter the meeting muted. Participants will be unmuted when called upon to speak by the chair or moderator. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself to avoid unnecessary background noise. All votes must be roll call votes. After a motion is made and there is a second, the chair will ask for a roll call vote. For applicants and presenters, applicants and presenters will be made temporary panelists in order to share their screens while giving their presentation. All present presenters and speakers need to identify themselves by first and last name and affiliation when speaking for the public record. Non-presenting applicants can use the raise hand button or press star nine on their phone to identify themselves to the chair. The moderator will unmute the applicants when they're called upon to speak. For public participation, comments or questions from the public will be taken at the discretion of the chair. Members of the public may speak by selecting the raise hand button and waiting for the chair to speak on them, to call on them to speak, excuse me. If you are dialing into the number provided, you may press star nine on your phone to indicate that you would like to comment. Members of the public recognized by the chair are asked to identify themselves by first and last name and affiliation for the public record, and then provide their comment each time that they speak. I'll now hand the meeting back to the chair. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Grace. All right, everybody. So our, uh, our first um, agenda item is a new business. Um, we have an intent to demolish um, number 1272 route 28. Um, it is listed as approximately 75 years old, um, it is not listed or inventoried on MACRIS or on the National Register, and it is not located within the Bass River Historic District. It was built around 1930, um, and it does show a colonial revival style. Um, I'm not sure if everybody had a chance to look at the photos of it. Uh, it looked like at one time it was kind of cute and looked kind of okay, but now it's pretty much falling apart. Um, Grace, go ahead. Just to let you know that the applicant is present to speak on this as well. Oh, okay, good. Um, can we let them in? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's wait for them to, and who is this? What is the, who's the person? Oh, Jason Fraser. And is he the owner or uh, who is he? He's the owner. Okay. Hi, Jay. We can see you. Thanks for coming. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Well, thank you. Good. All right. Um, all right. Bob, I saw your hand up. Did you have a comment? Yes, I did. I got this yesterday. I did some research on it, and I have the origins of the property. Okay. Go ahead. If anybody's interested. Um, this is a piece, it was uh, a larger piece of property was sold by deed in 1909 from Benjamin Homer to Isaiah, to Isaiah F. Homer. Um, and it was then uh, 171 feet by 141 feet. And the 141 was along um, what is now Route 28, but then just a path. In 1936, Isaiah uh, F. Homer sells the property to John G. Sears and John G. Sears Jr. These are John Sears' parents and grandparents. 
It was then the same size along Route 28. The Sears is divided the property in half to approximately 171 by 70, the 70 being along Route 28. And um, it was then called the State Highway. In 1941, the Sears is sell it to Albert and Ethel Whitehead. It is at this point, I believe, that there was a building on it because they took a larger piece, divided, subdivided it in half. And uh, there was no mention in any of the deeds that I looked at of any buildings uh, present standing thereon. Um, and then in eight, 1981, so the Whiteheads lived there uh, for 40 years. And Albert Whitehead Jr. sold the property to James W. Dooley. Dooley uh, mortgaged the property to um, James F. Ruin. And eventually James F. Ruin got the property and deeded it over to Catherine L. Cron in 1996. That's as far as I took it. But what I discern from this is that the building is circa 1941. Okay, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, okay, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Jay, did you want to talk about the building at all? Let us know kind of what you're. I just want to give you guys uh, just a little insight. So my name is Jay Frazier. I own Platinum Auto Service in South Yarmouth. Um, we were recently just approved for a addition on our existing property in Commercial Street, which is a short distance from here, um, just uh, just off of Route 28. So I just want to give you a little history. This, you know, I've known Catherine Cron, her son, for a long time. We've been talking about this property for a while. And when I got approved for the expansion, um, I thought that it was best suited for me to find another piece of property close by where I could future potential. I could expand into either sales or rentals. And I looked at, you know, my, my intention was to try and buy this property because it's close by my existing business and be able to, you know, hopefully rehab the building, turn it into an office, a rental, something on the lines of that. Um, unfortunately, you know, what I didn't realize is the overall condition of the building. I had builder's risk insurance on it. We closed on the property right around the end of the year. And shortly thereafter, about two or three weeks after, uh, we had that heavy snow and I couldn't believe it, but I came to work one morning and the building had collapsed. Um, you know, so my intention was to have a builder come in there and assess it and just see if it was, you know, something that we could, you know, uh, rehab, I guess, and, and, and clean up the property. And then, you know, whether one way for an investment or for future potential for my existing business, um, things obviously escalated and took a turn for the worst uh, shortly thereafter. And uh, so now I'm forced with an unsafe structure. I have to do something. Um, so all I'm looking at this point, I, I've done all the sign-offs, I've done the site plan so we could um, hopefully maintain that pre-existing non-conforming footprint so I can rebuild a structure in that same uh, footprint that's there. So I feel like I've done everything I can, but at this point, I'm left to, I have to just, you know, dispose of the building. We have to demolish it because it's definitely a safety concern at this point. Um, I know the towns, the building commission has reached out a couple of times. Uh, I know we've had some complaints about it, um, you know, I've had several builders and a, and a structural ar architect or engineer look at it. I mean, there's no, there's no salvaging it, obviously. There's nothing we can do. Um, it has to be torn down and rebuilt in that footprint. So that's all I'm trying to do is just get ahead of that before it becomes more of a liability. Thanks, Jay. That's, that's too bad. <laughs> Unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, George, go ahead. So, um, Jay, uh, thanks for coming in, George Lama. Um, so, uh, unless there's any other discussion, I think uh, Bob's work and research indicates that uh, the building is, is not um, architecturally uh, significant. Uh, and also that, um, you know, there is um, no other significance from an ownership standpoint. And unless there's additional um, comments, I would like to make a motion that uh, we approve the homeowner's request to demolish. Bob? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what are you proposing to 
I know you said the same footprint. What are you proposing to put back up? We haven't even gotten to that point. Honestly, this, this happened so quick after. Uh, my plan was to purchase it and then over the next year, put plans together and, and, and you know, put a plan together with, with BSE engineering. And, but I, I haven't even gotten to that point at this point. I, it's all happened so quickly. And at this point it's a liability. So I don't, you know, that's to be determined at this point. Um, but I, I wish I could give you more information, but it's, I don't have it at this time. Um, I assume some type of office, uh, possibly a, an office with an apartment upstairs because of housing issues. Um, but I don't know, I haven't even gotten to that point. Uh, whatever's allowed, whether it's for my business or as an investment, but um, I don't really. I was just, uh, I was curious as to what, whether you would put up a similar type building that had been there all that, all those years. The plan would be to do a wood structure in that footprint because that's what makes the property valuable. Um, it would be a wood structure. I, I'm pretty confident. Um, and I, you know, I like the thought of a first floor office with apartment upstairs. Um, but again, it's, it's too premature for me to give you any indication at this point, unfortunately. Jack, go ahead. Uh, I like the second uh, George's motion. Okay. I'm going to take a roll call for approval. Um, Melanie? Yes. Um, Kathy? Yes. Bob? Kelly? Yeah. Yes. Beverly? Yes. Bob Heisler? Yes. I also approve. Okay. Um, your motion has motions passed. Um, uh, your demolition is approved. So uh, we'll get you a letter. Uh, Grace will write that and you should pick it up. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Uh, next thing we have is um, an update all the on the Blue Sky Towers construction of the wireless facility tower thing, Majigi. Um, I didn't get a chance to go on the link and look at the photos, but I don't know if anybody else did. Um, do we have any discussion about this? Karen. Hi. Um, I just wanted to provide some context to everybody. So um, you all had gotten word of this through, um, I think the section 206 process. And we, and we talked about it early on at that time uh, we knew this would be um, a development of regional impact, but they had not yet submitted an application uh, to the Cape Cod Commission for their development of regional impact. Um, so they, they've done that. There was a kind of a, a, a snafu and applications weren't distributed. I believe the, the first public hearing on the item will be held in June, uh, June 9th. Um, it was supposed to be next week. But um, anyways, so what happens is the Cape Cod Commission will review this project, soliciting feedback uh, from the public and um, from the town. The Historic Commission doesn't have a purview per se on the project. Um, but if you recall, uh, Sarah Korjeff's comments, because when it came through on the Section 206, we reached out to Sarah kind of asking, uh, you know, what's going to happen with this? And Sarah's, Sarah's comment was this, I'm just reading from an email, uh, the town can choose to comment or not, and this is you guys, um, but it's probably good to go on record that the town is aware of historic resources that could be impacted by the project. Um, you know, the, the, with the um, Bass River National Register Historic District, uh, somewhat proximate to uh, the location of the proposed uh, cell tower. And that's for anybody who doesn't know, it's, it's at the um, Catholic church that's right on Route 28, um, opposite the Dunkin' Donuts, kind of by the Walgreens and, and whatnot. Um, I think Grace forwarded it around uh, a copy of the materials that have been submitted to the commission. It does include a number of visual depictions um, for the poll, um, it, it, you know, we've, we've noted and, and will be noting, uh, through other comments that, uh, the visual, you know, visual depiction from say the Dunkin' Donuts, 
or like when you're just right at the lights there, um, those were not submitted. Um, and, and there may be some visual impact. But I think it's, you know, it's up to you guys. You don't have to comment. You're welcome to comment. We wanted to kind of close the loop and make sure uh, we came back to you um, since you, you'd heard about it before. Um, and if you'd like to submit a letter, you know, it, you know, it, it's up to you what you wanted to say. You know, you could just say it's close to the uh, historic district and we are concerned. I mean, you don't really know uh, too much more at this point. So yeah, that's good, Grace. So I think these are from the uh, commission website. Grace is circling around the uh, balloon test that was done originally. Um, so there's the locus. I think if you go, Grace, can you go back to that slide just to explain? So if you guys see all the red dots, um, those are the locations from which the visual uh, depictions were done. I'm not sure what 1, 3, 6, and 14 are. They may be uh, the same. Um, Grace? Yes. Would, would you? Um, scan down um, to those pages that you referenced. And there are a few photos that, that show the tower um, with the wings on it. Mm -hmm. So if you could scroll down. Uh, go back up right there. And I, I thought I thought initially uh, that this was going to be encased in like a steeple. That that is not a steeple. No, it, my under so George, I'm not an expert on uh, cell towers. Uh, that's my disclosure. But um, I guess there's two kinds. One is enclosed, and one is not enclosed. And what's been proposed is not enclosed. Uh, so you see everything. Well, um, you know, that's that's not consistent with the document that we originally looked at this and it, it, it and it talked about a tower um, in it, you know, in a bell, like a church tower. So uh, there's a document that that stated that. This is what's currently proposed. Okay, thank you. Very handsome. Yeah, it looks real nice. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, that's, that's great. Wow. Oh, wow. The Osprey will like it. <laughs> <laughs> we could build them a platform instead. Yeah, totally. Jack, go ahead. Uh, I, I guess this was a question for uh, Karen and or Grace, uh, it's outside the historic district, but it's on Route 28. It's a 120 foot monopole and the town has spent a lot of time and uh, energy and money They're trying to uh, make Route one, uh, make, make Route tw <coughs> 28 a, uh, a more attractive place. And now you have a proposal to put up this monopole there uh, like I said, for Karen or Grace, what what opinions has the the town voiced on putting up? Uh, I think it's fair to call it an industrial structure of that height on Route 28. So, I can I can try to answer some of that, Jack. Um, so the the way a development of regional impact works is um, usually the project. Th there's two kinds. Of, of referrals that a town will make over to the Cape Cod Commission. There's a mandatory referral, and that's when uh, certain thresholds are, are triggered that are part of the Cape Cod Commission's uh, regulations. Uh, and then there's discretionary. So this, this particular uh, proposal tripped mandatory DRI review, 
once that referral was made from the building department over to the Cape Cod Commission, local permitting stops. So yeah. the commission takes over. What I can tell you is um, the the pole, I, th I think that the pole height is not consistent with the zoning regulations in terms of the height of the structure in particular. So okay. it would require local relief um, once the Cape Cod Commission is done with their review. So it, it would come back through here. It needs to go through obviously the building department, um, uh, site plan review, design review, because it's on Route 28. Um, it, you know, I, I appreciate your comments about the work done on Route 28. I, I tend to agree with you. It, it, it may detract uh, from some of the progress that we've been able to make. Um, I, I, I think that there will be a lot of discussion about this. Kathy uh, Williams, so part of the process with the development of regional impact, the commission does uh, a staff report. So they review the project based on the application materials uh, they've received. Those are all available online. I think Grace gave you the, the application. Um, they have reached out and we will provide comment uh, back to them in terms of consistency with local planning efforts and local planning regulations. Um, that information should hopefully be folded into the staff report. That will go to a subcommittee uh, the regulatory subcommittee, and I think that this is probably the group that will meet on June 9th to open the hearing and, and start the review. So, um, you know, if the that at that point, uh, you know, all the correspondence um, that comes either from the town, from town boards, town committees, um, uh, individuals, you know, just from the public, for sure, um, the that will also be considered by the the commission. That's, that's, that's good. That's a helpful answer. I asked the question, even though it pushes the envelope for a historic commission view, be, because it does affect the way I think about uh, what we ought to do on something like this. Has the Chamber of Commerce weighed in at all early uh, on an, with an opinion? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. How about, uh, uh, what's the name of the, of the association down there in the historic district? Uh, I, I'm not aware. So I'm not aware of what comments have been made formally yeah. uh, on the process. So like I said, we, we realized um, internally that, you know, that uh, kind of we hadn't gotten, we're required to get a copy of the application, a hard copy yeah. of the application, and we had not yet received that. So we had this kind of scheduling snafu and things have been postponed to June 9th. So at that point, you know, all the correspondence and you'd certainly, if you want to know what comments are received, that's a question for the, uh, the Cape Cod Commission. Okay, I, 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 think, uh, I think it's important for us as a group to know the answer to some of those questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 would, I guess I would, from a historic preservation standpoint, uh, one, I think we ought to write a letter of some sort. I'm not sure what exactly to say in the letter. Uh, there's really two points to consider. One is the specific point of 120 foot monopole that's outside of a historic district. But I think the more important point is the larger one and that is about tall structures that uh, are near historic districts and have some kind of a visual impact. I'm a little familiar with those balloon tests uh, I'm not sure how, what, what particular value to associate with them. They tell you something, but I don't think they tell you everything. Uh, I don't think there's a so-called shadow effect for a monopole, uh, like you might see in a big city where they're putting up a multi-story building. But I, th I think there's a role here for this commission to say something to, to convey to the Cape Cod Commission that we have a concern about uh, a tower like this near the South Yarmouth uh, Historic District. And, and it's, it's to make the larger point about we, we want to know about these things in advance and we do have opinions about them. This may not be the first and the only time 
a large structure is built next to a historic district. Maybe the town wants to, the town historic commission wants to have a view. But that's my thoughts on on all of this. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Bob, you're muted. I have a question. I apologize if, if this material has already been sent and I didn't read it as such, but um, I had a similar structure in a town I lived in prior to coming here uh, in Tennessee. It was a tall um, cell tower and it had three guide wires, heavy cable guide wires that extended about 300 feet uh to hold this thing in place is there such a th is is that part of the structure and they may have new um engineering now that allows it to stand free and clear of that but i don't know i don't believe so bob um but i i can't say that with 100 percent certainty okay uh, count melanie go ahead this may, I just, what, what is the functionality of this in terms of who wants it and, and what service does it supply so that people who want it would be able to advocate for it? What, what does it do for people? Well, it, you know, it, if you read the um, description, it's uh, T-Mobile. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's increasing, uh, you know, the um, strength of the signal and gives T-Mobile more, you know, marketing material to say that uh, they got better coverage. So, so it's, it's, it's all about internet and all about, um, um, you know, I mean, it raises the whole question about people living contiguous to it as to whether, you um, They'll be experiencing, you know, issues with um, TV and and uh, you know access. So, um, so I would think there's entities out there that would address that. Yeah. The um, Melanie, just I'm I'm looking at the application cover sheet, and I think Bob, this may answer your question as well. And the the brief project description is uh, the applicant proposes. 120 foot monopole tower within a 70 by 75 foot area surrounded by a six foot high chain link fence. T-Mobile is proposing nine panel antennas and single dish at 150, 115 foot ACL, I don't know what that acronym is, with ground equipment including backup generator. AT&T is proposing six panel antennas at 100 feet ACL with ground equipment, including backup generator. Yeah, that, that answers it. I think I had read that and I wasn't sure if the if there were wires beyond the, the 75 foot yeah. fence, but- I'm, I'm still not certain, but that is what it says. Yeah, so. it, must, it must be on four points then coming out of the ground mm -hmm. and going up. Um, Jack, go ahead. Uh, I guess it's related to what I, one of the points I was making earlier about uh, uh, public comments from either individuals who live in the historic district or the association for that historic district. How uh, do, what kind of uh, advance notice has been given to the public that this is up here? We're talking about it at this meeting and Karen explained the background of how it came to uh, a mandatory review referral to the Cape Cod Commission. But uh, my question is, uh, is this public knowledge to the people who live in South Yarmouth, uh, specifically no. in the historic district? No. And, it's, no. It's, on, it's all over the commission's website. So, and, and I think that it's, I can't rattle off the top of my head, I apologize, what their noticing requirements are, but you know, we, we've got the public notice, it's been, the hearing's been continued, but I don't know what direct a butter notification they provide. Okay, I, I hear you, that, uh, that's, 
that's kind of like opening the door, <laughs> not to be too flip or, or clever, but mm -hmm. putting it on the commission website is kind of like opening the door at midnight and saying, hey, uh, look at this, and then closing it. Uh, it's different than, well, I, I, it's no criticism on anybody. It's just a no. comment on, on, on how word spreads among the public about something that might be of interest. Mm -hmm. Beverly? Uh, I wasn't really sure about the location. I'm really sorry. I know that they mentioned the church. Is it on the church property? Yes. Or is it, please? Yes. Yes, it, it is. And is and the church has not made any comments about it as well? Did they sell the church property? Is probably, or? The church is probably getting an income from it. Right. I would imagine the church is leasing the property to them, leasing oh. that area. Yeah, we could have done this on, the, sorry. Go ahead, George. No, finish up, Bob. Sorry. We've had these proposals for the historical society grounds. Um, you can make like, I don't know, $10,000 a month. Oh my God. Rent from it. So I'm, I'm sure that's why they did it. They had the property and they want to do it. George, go ahead. Uh, uh, Grace. Yeah happened recently in Barnstable. Um, I was on a church property in Centerville um, just to create a synonymous parallel to that. Um, it was denied for other reasons um, other than what we're discussing, but just to see a full process about, you know, if you're looking to follow a timeline of events about what usually happens, that would be helpful as well. George? Um, uh, to um, Jack's comment about getting the word out, um, I'd, I'd like to, you know, hear some discussions as to what the town is going to do to, um, you know, get word out through social media and, and the website um, and Facebook, um, notifying, uh, you know, the town residents that, that, you know, this is in the, on the horizon and, and give them a heads up. Um, we, so I know that the, uh, this will be a agenda item on the planning board's uh, schedule, I believe next week, George, and uh, something more may have, more may come out of it at that. We've notified the um, town administrator's office, and I'm not sure, what I don't know is whether or not the public hearing notice was in the selectman's packet. But we, you know, it's not standard practice. It hasn't been in the past, not to say it can't be, um, to, to let people uh, know about it. Um, but we, we haven't planned any, you know, outreach of any kind at this time. Um, thank you. Um, one of the things I'd like the committee to, um, you know, keep in mind that uh, if we approve to do a letter that, um, you know, part of the motion, I would suggest that um, our letter go up on our website um, for the Historical Commission uh, to indicate, um, you know, our comments. Um, yeah, Melanie, go ahead. Just referring to what uh, Grace said about Centerville, what I remember because I used that library at times that it was the abutters, it was the really close by who knew what was happening, that, that raised an enormous amount of objection. And if people don't know, they can't raise objections. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think we should put something together. Um, I feel like, I think Jack said, I don't know exactly what it should say either, but um, I definitely think we should have our voice heard uh, and presented with everything, uh, uh, any other comments that get submitted. So um, I don't know who would like to work on maybe drafting a letter. Um, Grace, go ahead. Just to keep in mind that the letter needs to be in the purview of the impact of the historic aesthetic. As an abutter, we are supposed to be cognizant about structures or any type of infrastructure that is being installed that might impact the historic district. So I just want to make sure that we keep it focused on that because that has that you know, at the end of the day, it's a part of your board. That. Yeah, that's that's where that's where all we can really say. That's where we can come from. So yeah, I understand that. 
Um, yeah, Karen? Just, just one, two notes that I'd, I'd suggest. So one, you, you might also uh, copy the Board of Selectmen on any correspondence, certainly. And then the um, other item is I, I would expect um, that the the hearing on June 9th um, won't be the only hearing. Um, so I, I think it will be, you know, that's the initial one where there's um, a subcommittee that, you know, reviews the materials. They start asking questions. They might ask for additional information um, and, and that type of thing. And then there's, there's usually follow up. Um, it used to be, I don't know with um, in the COVID world, um, it, there was always a requirement that a hearing be held in the community. So somewhere in Yarmouth. So um, I'm not sure how that will be handled. I imagine it's just another Zoom at this point, but. Okay, thank you. Uh, George? Um, Jack, um, you know, based on your initial comments, uh, would you um, be available to, to make um, a motion, uh, please? Um, I, I uh, recommend that the commission send a letter, uh, the historical commission send a letter to the Cape Cod commission expressing our concerns about uh, about building this structure near, so near a historic district. That's about as general as I could say, I think at this point, and the letter itself may want to figure out a two or three bullets of a more granular nature to, to include in there, but that a motion to send, send the commission a letter expressing our concerns. Could I have a second? Karen, you're muted. Is your concern primarily the visual impact as of coming from the historic purview as Grace's suggestion uh, was? Yes, and, the, and, the, and I think uh, the visual impact and the precedent it sets for whatever it might come after it. Uh, I, I think it's probably outside the historic commission's uh, uh, purview to suggest, uh, maybe it isn't, but to suggest that more public uh, knowledge of this uh, proposal needs to occur. But uh, Karen, I don't know whether you think we should, you know, does that, uh, should we include I don't, something? I don't see harm in that. Um, okay. All right. I, then, I don't then. see harm in, you know, you encourage additional uh, public outreach to um, inform the public. Okay. All right. Then let's let's include that in the as one of the talking points in the in the in the letter. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, Melanie, go ahead. I would just say for one of the talking points, the idea that they said it was going to be enclosed and obviously it was not, and that it was supposed to have something that looked like a steeple. Then where's the steeple? I mean, obviously you didn't say it like that. Beverly, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, sh should we make, um, is there some way to connect with the Bass River Civic Commission? I mean, they have an organization that, can we make comments with, or contact with them and make sure that they're aware of it as well? I'm concerned that they're not even aware. Jack? I, Beverly, I think that's an excellent point. I think it could be easily taken care of uh, by sending them a CC copy of, uh, of the letter. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody want to second Jack's motion? I'll Jack? second Jack's motion. <laughs> okay. I'll roll a call for approval. George? Aye. Melanie? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Bob Kelly? Yep. Okay. And Bob Heislet. Yes. And I also, yes. Okay, so our motion has passed, um, unanimous. Uh, we'll need to get that letter drafted. I don't know if someone wants to put together like an outline and email it to Grace. Anybody willing to do that? Jack, George, anyone? 
I know George tricked me into making the motion, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, not going to be tricked into to volunteering it. Uh, I, I've got enough on my plate. I, I think. Uh, I think if someone was taking notes uh, in the last ten minutes, all the talking points are there, and probably it's a two-paragraph letter. Uh, and particularly the point that Karen raised about or, or confirmed that we should include uh, a, a reference to uh, uh, making this proposal uh, more widely known to the public in town. Grace? Julie, I took notes. Um, I don't have an issue just drafting up a letter and then sending it out for people. Okay. To yeah. I nominate you for St. Louis. <laughs> we nominate you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Karen. Okay, next. Uh, let's see here. All right, next we just have an update on the town seal presentation for the select board. Um, George? And uh, very quickly, um, uh, the, it appears that the um, presentation date has been moved out to Tuesday, June 22nd. And oh, okay. uh, so. Um, so we don't need any further discussion at this stage. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I see that on there now. Okay. Um, can we have a update on the windmill, the recent uh, site visit and updates? Got that. Grace? Beverly, did you want to? Oh, sure. <laughs> you don't have to. I can as well. I just didn't want to, you know. Your no, um, <laughs> Karen and and uh, Grace and I went to the windmill, kind of looked through it, and you know we found a lot of um, mice damage. Anyway, um, so that was kind of a concern. Uh, I I had talked to the volunteers, and they really some of the volunteers were interested in opening the mill, whether uh, covert or not. So I've kind of written. Um, up a, a protocol for how we could do that. And it's, and we have to meet with the Department of Health to see if they agree. I've checked with volunteers and I'm really not gonna have enough volunteers to open every week. So I've kind of looked at it and thought maybe they would only be two weeks per month starting in July um, and just on the weekends so that we're not cut, com, coming into any holiday weekends. So it's kind of a sketchy look. Um, I have, like four people that are interested out of 12, which makes it kind of difficult for them to cover. And I really need to spend a little more time with the health department to make sure that they're comfortable with it. This COVID is, I don't think it's gonna get better at this point, not with all the people coming on the Cape and bringing it with them. So I have, you know, I have a lot of health concerns and basically I'm a health professional, so I would but um, that's kind of where I am with it, just kind of still playing with it, you know, feeling it out and just seeing how we could make it the best. You know, I laid it out so that it would be less contact um, with people by don't only allowing a few people in at the time and the people that I've talked to, I've given them, um, you know, the plan, the sketchy plan that it is. And um, they agree. They agree based on what my plan has, how I've stated my plan. But I still have some concern. And yes, Bob. <laughs> um, I'm I'm happy to review your plan because I've I've sent th three different plans to Bruce Murphy: one to open the Quaker Meeting House, one to open the Banks Hallett House, and one to op open the Kelly Chapel and um, parameters around the we two that we just built. So um, if, if you want any assistance, I'd be happy to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Grace, you want to uh, add some information? So you pretty much covered it all. Um, we are looking at a better pest control plan for the windmill, um, just because when we went over there, it's, it's apparent that um, the plan that we have in place right now isn't working out to what we think, you know, could be operated at a, a better better level. So we're working to optimize that. But other than that, I think you covered it all, Beverly. I, I'm, I just have some, con um, I think COVID has made us think about life a little differently. And um, 
thinking that this may be the time to look at the windmill and look at it in a different way as well. Um, we talked about signage and I think that that would be a great help. We could make sure that everyone is getting educated on what the windmill was about. I think we could ask signs for the, about the mill. I think we could have a sign about salt works, which is so important to keep in, um, keep in our history. Uh, so I'm kind of looking at that and wondering maybe we should be doing some website kind of, um, you know, getting comments, you know, how they do at the, some, at the, some of the uh, National Seashore where you just press a button, you get the information and we could do that with our signs. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that. A lot of the volunteers are like me, older, and um, they're, it's hard for them to do as much as they have in the past. And I'm losing people because of that. And the younger people are really not interested, but they love their phones and they love getting as much information off their phones. So I'm kind of thinking maybe we need to start thinking outside the box, even for the, the windmill or start to prepare for that. Um, I think that's an excellent idea, Beverly. Um, I do have experience and background in public history in the form of creating virtual experiences um, such as that. There is a virtual application of which I've worked with quite a bit called the Clio. And what that does is that it either creates virtualized experiences with individual historic sites, or what you can actually do is create a historic walking tour, um, walking to use lightly because it's also the virtual app where you could actually put everything onto this application and you can either use it on a website or you can do it on your phone and all of the information comes up. You have full ability to edit it. Um, map everything out, and then we can link that with the signage at the windmill if that's something that we all wish to do. And then we could also put on some web pages so then when people visit the website. So you could kind of fit all three, the phones, the website, and the signage at the mill. That sounds really cool. Like Thank amazing. you. Yeah. Um, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, uh, two years ago, I put a proposal together um, and gave it to Karen Green I forget, hi Karen, and I forget who the group was that that reviewed it, but um, apparently there was somebody on that committee that was against those signs. And so the signs never, never got made. We were thinking about three signs because access to Bass River for the public mm -hmm. is extremely narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, along the river. It, there's only a few places and that's one of them. And that's a pivotal point. Um, from that point, you could have seen Kroll's Pier, which is what Smuggler's Beach got its name from. Um, mm -hmm. The salt works were right there in Bass River Village. And of course, the, um, the Judah Baker Mill itself. So I was proposing three signs. So as you're looking at Bass River, from the parking lot of that, they would have been located on the grass along the right side of the property up against the, the border of the property. So as not to obstruct any view from the parking lot out into the water uh, or obstruct any one who wanted to take a picture of the mill, there wouldn't be a picture of this you know, sign in it. Uh, and that's what was proposed. And we, we were going to have QR codes uh, on those, just like we did on the Indian Memorial. Um, so that was out there. I think we had a cost of, uh, for the three signs at like uh, $3,300 a sign, something like that. That was with all of the design work and all that. And we had people lined up. Uh, the cost would probably be a little more now, I suppose, but um, that's what was that's what was proposed a couple of years ago. Yes, I remember that, Bob, but I'm glad you're, you know, you're bringing it back up and talking about it again with me because that was a great idea and we did talk about it and I don't know what happened that it went by the wayside, but whatever, and I don't know how that happened. 
My my recollection, Bob, was, and I don't know if you have the same. I think that the um, they so the group was the Community and Economic Development Committee, um, and the idea was they oversee the Tourism Revenue Preservation Fund. So I think we were looking for for funds. Um, I think their main concern, I'd have to go back and look at the minutes, was the number of signs. And I think they didn't like the three. And I don't know if, you know, we could go back with two or, I, I mean, I think that Beverly's comments um, are really good and, and timely and that the world really has changed in the last, you know, 18 months. And, um, you know, it, it's even more reason to do those those kinds right. of educational uh, signs. And I do think all your information was, the, the quotes were very good because I think they were based on actuals that we got through the Indian Memorial uh, sign, right. which, which is lovely and has held up quite nicely. And I think that it, um, I, I thought it was a great idea too. And um, I think that, um, you know, that, that sign at Indian Memorial is a, is a really nice, uh, model to mm -hmm. uh, to use and build on, and so you have one there. And you know, I think we we talked about you know a, a whole plan because eventually we'll get to the Baxter Gristmill, and you can roll them out there too. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we can go back. I I, I I I don't think there's any harm in in making another uh, request. George. Um. Thank you, Karen. That's my recollection. Um, I would like to offer that um, uh, the, the CPC was uh, over the moon with the uh, sign that was um, developed at Indian Memorial. And, um, and there is money available through the CPA to fund these. And so I would uh, suggest that the, um, you know, the commission consider putting an application in um, you know, for the fall uh, for three signs, and um, and uh, you know that way um, we we control um, who we're asking the money for, and uh, as the historical commission, I would tend to think that it's our purview to decide how many signs would go there, um, and uh, and we would um, you know make that recommendation to the CPC. So uh, that's my two cents. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Uh, I'm, uh, did I unmute myself? I did. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I agree with everything I just heard, Bev and Bob and, and, and George, uh, Karen's comments about the CEDC. Uh, I would add for my two cents that uh, for, for what George is suggesting to come back in the fall with, that we think through uh, a larger package of signs rather than to do this piecemeal doesn't need that mean that you need to do every sign at the same time but i think it would be useful to for this commission to think about uh, a package of signs that cover uh, a number of historic points in the town where a sign would be really useful uh, Bray Farm did this stuff several years ago. Uh, we paid for it ourselves. We worked with Cape Tech and we got actually a very nice, generous donation from um, the uh, Bilizikian Family Foundation to, to pay for those signs. I'm thinking in particular to add to what we just talked about, something we talked about earlier, and that is signs to take note of the Wampanoag presence along Bass River. Uh, I've, I've talked a little bit to Marcus Hendricks about this. Bob and George and I have talked about it informally. And I think George, even at one point when you and I visited uh, before COVID with the chairman of the Dennis Historical Commission, we talked a little bit about coordinating Native American signage with the uh, a Dennis Historical Commission for both sides of Bass River because back in pre-colonial times, Wampanoags didn't recognize <laughs> that there was going to be two towns. Uh, uh, but I think there's a great opportunity here to educate the public. And Beverly's uh, really put her finger on something that's correct. The 
COVID, uh, post-COVID thinking is, is driving a lot of first, second, third order of change in our world. And one of them is the way we spread, we, we conduct educational activities, uh, signage being one way to do it and QR codes and the town website and whatever it is. Uh, but I think we should look at a larger package uh, 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 that to, to present in the fall. And I, I specifically would like to see something happen on uh, Wampanoag history front for, along the Bass River. Yeah, uh, I agree with everybody. I think that's a fantastic idea. I definitely think we should put something together um, for the fall. Um, I saw, let's see, um, Melanie, go ahead. I would just like to say the conversation that's just started is one that uh, Laurel Cable and I have just had about ancient cemetery, about signage, QR codes, educational tools that families with children could take independently if they have some information on their phone, they don't need a more for yeah. QR code and have the information about where to go for a walk. It's all of going in that direction, as Ms. Merrick said, educating the public. Yeah, it's a fantastic idea. Um, Bob, go ahead. Hey, Jack, if you remember a couple of years ago uh, when we presented this, um, we were going to do it in stages. We were going to do like three signs a year. I, I got to tell you, it took George and I five months, six months to develop that Indian Memorial sign. And I had all the history already. So it's, it's, they're not easy it, to do it right and to get it right uh, and not rush it. Uh, you can only do so many, I think, a year. Um, but that's, you know, that that was our thinking. But we did we we did have plans to expand it beyond uh, the Judah Baker Mill because we did talk about Packet Landing. We talked about having some signs come, you know, uh, be erected right off the um, the railing that goes around. Uh, that pavilion and stuff like that. So we, we, you know, um, that was part of the plan. Yeah. Well, point well taken, Bob. I, I, I did the, the narratives for all of the six signs over at the farm. And quite frankly, that was the easiest part. The hardest and most frustrating and drawn out part was going back and forth with uh, Cape Cod Tech's uh, IT department, which was doing the actual design work for the signs themselves and then producing them. And we went through phases. They produced temporary signs and they looked great, but were in fact temporary when the weather intervened. And then the Bill Azikian Family Foundation came along with a gracious and very timely donation to let us do permanent signs. So yeah, I, you, you know, in, in the end, you, you tend to forget about the bad parts along the road, you just look at the end of the road and say, well, those signs look great, but uh, thanks for the reminder <laughs> that there were a lot of headaches for Hank Tuin and myself uh, on those signs. I still think we could, we, if we go to the CPC to ask for money, we should make clear that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a package deal. And I think, I think it makes an impression on the CPC to, uh, to let the committee members and the committee know that we've got a sort of a big picture plan in place and, and, and that we're going to do it in stages. They may even like to approve it as a big picture plan. And then we don't have to keep going back three signs at a time, but that's, that's sure. tactical stuff. We can talk about that later. Yeah. I kind of feel like that's sort of what we had planned a while ago to do it like that. Like we had, like we had come up with a whole bunch that we wanted to do. And then we were like, yes, let's do, three a year, whatever it was. And and then, yeah, like everyone's saying, it just never really came through. Um, George, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just to, uh, you know, kind of bundle things up, I, um, um, I think all of the points have been hit. I mean, when the CPC um, grant is approved, uh, there's usually a um, indication that uh, money needs to be spent over a three year period. So that would, um, 
tie neatly into, you know, Jack, what were you talking about? So uh, I, I think we got two parallel routes to follow here. Grace's uh, recommendation to um, work on a digital footprint and, and you know, that can be done um, on a shorter term and, and then the longer term would be uh, the signage that we've just talked about. So um, thanks all. What do we need to do next? Yeah, what do we need to do next? Do we, uh, I mean, well, this would be not for, not for a while. We'd be looking to put something together to present at the fall CPC, George, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe Grace could put it on our agenda for next time for our June meeting. Yeah. yeah. Talk about it a little bit more. Bob, yeah, we should probably think about um, nine to ten signs where they would be for the present. In other words, yeah. so yeah, we have this this ongoing program. We feel we can develop, you know, three a year, but this is what we're thinking of for the three year program. And yeah. and and we do uh, have documentation that we created as part of our brainstorming. Um, several years ago, so we're not um, inventing the wheel. We, we have, um, you know, work that we've done on this and, and we can pull it back up. Yeah, yeah sure. let's do that. And um, let's readdress this next time. Great, that's awesome, everybody. Um, okay, Taylor Bray, 20th anniversary celebration updates. Jack, go ahead. Okay, uh, I, I've not had time to work on uh, a 20th anniversary uh, draft letter for us and or the selectmen to, uh, uh, to send to the Farm Association, but that's on my uh, to-do list. I welcome ideas from others uh, uh, on, on how to put together a letter. Uh, uh, Karen and Grace specifically on how to write to the selectmen since I sometimes stumble over those kind of things. Uh, but uh, unless there's another volunteer to do the draft, uh, that's that's on my to-do list. Uh, it's It's been 20 years to this point, so I think another month probably is not going to uh, uh, do any harm. Uh, I had, uh, so, Yesterday, I met with Bob and Marty uh, to talk about other, had, a, had a long, good session with them uh, on a variety of topics and specifically went to talk to them about the status of the George Bray collection. And we, uh, we lapsed into a number of other things, but I'll defer to Karen, uh, who I met with earlier yesterday morning to discuss some archeological things. And Marty joined that meeting near the end uh, Karen and Grace at the farm, uh, uh, and Karen, I don't know. You want to you want to pick it up from there, or oh, I'm I'm happy I'm happy to, and I do think that um, you know, so I guess there's three things um, that I'd chime in about for Taylor Bray Farm. Two of them are very much related, um, but the first just related to the uh, letter that you're or, or the memo that you're looking to. Um, put to the Board of Selectmen, you know, we took liberty uh, because the Selectmen meetings always um, take some time to schedule um, ahead of time. And we do have a placeholder on the Selectmen agendas for June 8th um, for something related to Taylor Bray Farm. And I, I, I do think it makes great sense. I've got my fingers crossed that uh, we'll have a sheep festival on June 20. So it would be, it would be really nice uh, time frame. So I don't know, Jack, if you, I'm happy to help, um, with, with any memo, um, but, and we could coordinate with the selectman's office if they can prepare some kind of citation or something like that, which would be nice and could be displayed at the farm eventually. Um, but we, oh. so I guess long story short, we need, we need to do that sooner rather than later. I'll, I'll call you uh, today's Thursday. Maybe you've got 10 minutes tomorrow to just talk about what should be in there, and then I'll go from there and yep. get the mid, mid to late morning would be great. Late, um, mid, what'd you say, mid to? Mid to late morning. Okay. Please. Um, 
related to the barn, and, and I do wanna, uh, I know Jeff Colby has uh, been uh, patiently in the audience and, and he's here uh, and available to join us, I think, um, to answer any questions. The, the barn bids were uh, received on Monday. They came in over budget. I think that Grace forwarded out a, um, a copy of the memo. We, we copied you guys on um, and happy to report that the CPC um, considered this uh, memo yesterday and have agreed to increase the amount of funding for the barn project up to $419,297. Uh, the base bid came in uh, at 329. We've requested, um, we, we, we took liberty to request uh, alternate one, which I think Jeff could explain better than I can uh, if you're interested. Uh, a 15% contingency and construction services that would be required uh, based on the new budget. Um, we opted not to go for the uh, alternates two and three uh, because they're more aesthetic in nature. And while it would be nice to do that, we really haven't gone through the regulatory process and we need to, uh, we want to do things right. We want to do things carefully and thoughtfully, number one. Um, and we need to execute a contract with the um, selected bidder. Um, so I don't know if anyone has questions on that item because Jeff, I think, is here, and uh, I'd like to free him up if he doesn't need to be here. Um, do we want to have Jeff come on and let us know any, anything else that we need to know? Grace, you'd have to elevate him, I think. Hi, Jeff. Hello. Uh, good morning. I love being elevated. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We'll demote you too, Jeff. <laughs> All right. I, can, I can appreciate that. Uh, I don't really think there's too much to add. Karen did a great job of, you know, reviewing the different elements. Um, you know, that alternate one, what I would say about that, uh, that is the structural uh, issues within the building, not, not anything uh, cosmetic or outside, but the, as the uh, commission's well aware, there is uh, some sagging roof issues. There's uh, some temporary shoring that has been done, but uh, there does need to be a permanent uh, fix to that. And that alternate one does take care of that. So that's, that's essentially what I would say. It's an exciting project. I'm really happy to, to see this moving forward. Uh, the only thing I would say about the uh, all five bids, we had five bids come in, so that's a, always a good thing, but all five bids were above the S Estimate of 300,000, and I think that's just because of the the heated construction environment that we're in. Um, you know, construction is coming in regularly 25% above uh, what had been just a short while ago, um, and so I think that uh, we got some decent prices given the the bidding climate that we're in. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Um, does anybody have any questions while Jeff and Karen are both here? Jack, Ben. Uh, hi, Jeff. Jack Duggan here. Uh, when you said alternate one, is that, could you just give us a 30 second description of what alternate one is? I think it means lifting the building up and replacing the foundation. Is that kind of close to what you're thinking about here? No, no, the, the, just a real briefly, um, the base bid is a, a slight elevation of the barn in order to uh, excavate and replace the foundation and also um, uh, reestablish the foundation with that shelf or ledge for uh, stone uh, facing of the foundation. Uh, that work and then to lower the, the building down on a um, rebuilt um, uh, deck associated with that first floor that will be uh, significantly uh, improved for loading purposes. Um, so that's really all in the base bid. 
Uh, alternate number one, and I'm looking at the plans now on the screen so I, I can make sure I get these terms correct for you, but alternate one includes uh, some roof trusses and uh, uh, gussets inside uh, the structure, uh, as well as securing some of the web members within uh, that roof structure. Uh, also, there's uh, three by eight uh, rafter ties that are needed on both sides of the rafters uh, in, the, in the attic area in which to support uh, that uh, roof uh, in a better way. And there's also some screws as well as uh, other structural members that are part of that uh, reinforcement of the roof structure. So uh, alternate one really is internal uh, and it is roof structure reinforcement. It is, is this it? Mm -hmm. That's the plans, yes. And, and okay. I was just looking at that when I was describing that to you. So if you open up to page uh, where was I just looking? It looks like page eight I was on. There's a pretty good description of the elements of uh, alternate one. Yeah, I think that I, I just got a chance to see this yesterday. Marty Murphy loaned me his <laughs> copy. It looks pretty thorough. I was, it, but it's, it's better read by someone who's not a liberal arts major, I guess, to, to understand <laughs> the, the particulars. Uh, I, I was wondering about uh, just what it included because I was confused as to three phases. Is that right? Well, I, I've been thinking of two, um, but yeah. in the discussion with CPC uh, yesterday, they said there could be potentially a, a third envisioned, which would be more kind of internal and in use of the structure. I, I was thinking more from a kind of a restoration standpoint that uh, this first phase would certainly be the most expensive, the most extensive. Um, and then the second phase would be more cosmetic in nature because we did get bid prices for some of that work. We have a much better feel for what the cost of that future phase might look like. Uh, but that, of course, would be windows, uh, trim work, uh, some of the gutter work. Um, and again, all that, as Karen mentioned, needs to continue to be further vetted to make sure it's being done uh, with everyone's um, interest in mind. Uh, and then the, the um, other alternate was for the roof work. Uh, that would all be kind of in a, in a second phase and uh, that still needs to be um, developed. It could be that, uh, you know, some elements get added to that as well, uh, but more, again, more of a cosmetic envelope um, type of phase, but uh, CPC certainly indicated that there might be a need and, and they're willing to fund uh, maybe a third phase, which would include some more internal use um, type of function to the building. And so uh, that's, I guess, what is a, a work in progress, but that's kind of, you know, one of the possibilities. Okay. So like things like down the road, I, I heard you say a lot of good things about roof trusses and rafter fixers, rafter thick fixing the rafters, the structural kind of stuff. But I, I kind of think what I'm hearing is that, that the visuals that uh, an outfit like Old Kings Highway be interested in, that would come later. It, it, exactly right. And Karen probably could elaborate on this better than I, but everything that we're doing in this first phase, we've got an exemption from Old Kings Highway on. They were comfortable with what we were doing, uh, but they wanted further review on things that would be in other phases. Is that would that be things like the type of shingles on the roof and the, the doors and windows that kind of stuff? I believe so, Jack. And Grace is actually our OKH expert, and uh, you know it's it's the how the building looks from the outside. So you know, are are we going to keep the windows exactly like they are, the grills exactly like they are, the the colors, the materials? I don't. What else, Grace? Um, Um, and well, I mean, in terms of the barn, I think that the only thing that they're looking for is um, just to be in kind for what is there and that's being done. Mm -hmm. um, as far as anything that's flushed the ground um, structurally, there's really no jurisdiction for open Highway, so the foundation and so forth. I, I think that it, it will like moving forward, my understanding is is it's always easiest to replace like with like. So, I think that would be my personal goal, but we haven't had that discussion and we haven't presented any of that to the old Kings Highway. So, okay, so, um, so that's like a to be determined phase. Yes. That's, that sounds reasonable. Yes. Uh, and, and just to follow up on Jeff's comment about the, the CPC's conversation, you know, it, it's um, some of the internal use, uh, particularly on the apartment side of the building, the, the space is chopped up and might be more uh, utilitarian uh, in, a, in a bigger open, more open space. And I think that's 
maybe just what people are are kind of alluding to. Um, okay. I, I got a specific question for Jeff. Uh, when you said, uh, I think the term you used was deck. I, I think uh, I think I know what that means, but do you want to explain it to a layman? The deck being the first floor and load capacity, stuff like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, that's exactly right. So what sits on top of the foundation, uh, it's very questionable in its condition right now. Um, <laughs> well, and so that's why... <laughs> and so I think that's a lot of the load concerns, uh, and there was some interest to making sure that that could be um, safe in the future for even um, the number of people that might be in and out of that structure, and in, and also with the storage of equipment uh, in that space as well. So uh, that's certainly going to be the case under the base bid with this project. Okay, are you are you thinking for the requirements for the deck load requirements for the deck? Uh, a tractor or other heavy equipment to, to meet meet uh, those kind of conditions? Or are you thinking more about just kind of a public space with people? Well, it is, it's been designed to meet the assembly loading in the building code, which is really high level. Um, I'm comfortable with the smaller pieces of equipment that they are planning to put in there as well, given that particular loading uh, is, is the highest uh, for uh, public assembly. Um, so with, with that said, um, you know, I don't know that we wanted to put, uh, you know, full size loaded trucks in there, but, you know, with, with small, uh, small tractors, small piece of equipment, they currently have, I think, uh, some tables and displays and refrigerators in there, you know, that type of thing is all uh, what it's being designed for. Could, could you put the John Deere, the John Deere tractor in there? Yes. Yeah. That would be what I consider smaller equipment. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. I did, I just want to make sure that that's, I don't think they want to put the Kubota in there. I don't know whether it would fit, but the John Deere certainly would. And I, there's a need to keep that out of the elements. Uh, uh, the only other question I came up when I, from just looking at this was, is part of uh, alternate one going to include, uh, there's some mention in here, I think of the laneway and I have this sort of vague recollection. I don't remember when you and I had a Zoom meeting or somewhere along the line, I had asked you a question about uh, the wall on the west side of the building leading out from the lane from the underneath portion of the, the barn. And I, I think what I saw in here was a reference to reusing the stones that are in there now that are that they, they form a laneway, but they're certainly not structurally safe. But what what is the plan for phase one here of that, that portion, portion? Right, for that uh, stretch that I believe you're talking about with uh, the small walls on either side, uh, the base bid calls for reconstruction of the disturbed portions of that wall. Uh, so we might find that that's only the first five or six feet, depending on how far they need to excavate uh, in order to get the foundation in there properly. Uh, they've also got to remove some material uh, and certainly that um, that laneway that you referred to would be a good way for them to remove material uh, yeah. through there. So if it disturbs more of the wall, they'll certainly need to fix that as part of the base bid. Uh, but whatever doesn't get rebuilt, um, it's certainly anticipated that we'd be able to use some of the contingency uh, to do that for whatever else needs to be added. It's, so one of the things that, that uh, CPC did approve yesterday was a pretty healthy contingency for this type of project in addition to the, to a, the increase to the base bids and the um, construction oversight services from coastal engineering. Uh, so that, that's all in the, um, in the new approved number, if you will. And yeah. so if some additional wall work that needs to be done that can be fit within the contingency. Yeah, I, I think what we had talked about, I, I had expressed the concern that, uh, that it kind of looked like it, that the, the, re, the finished job on the laneway portion looked like, looks like it does now. And I, I think at one point you had mentioned concrete walls, and then we talked a little bit, I think, about uh, using kind of a stone veneer so that, you know, I don't have a problem with a concrete wall, but I'd kind of like to keep that old look by, by using veneer. I think that's probably what you're talking about in the other parts of the foundation. And that's what was done on, uh, on the farmhouse rehab work uh, where it was required. Uh, uh, and I hope some good grading too. God, that's part of the whole problem of 
deterioration of that building. There's, there's too much water going in instead of out of it. Uh, uh, so the laneway is still to be determined. Is that it, it is it, it one I, I think what you're referring to is one of the I think the 50% design plans for the project showed uh, and this isn't anything we've given coastal direction on specifically but they showed some um, uh, poured concrete walls um, forming those uh, like the new laneway if you will and yeah. um, we told them that was not acceptable so that was taken off the plans it's, it's, there's no concrete walls being poured as part of that laneway as, as part of this project um, the walls are short enough that uh, they probably don't need that type of reinforcing if you will um, yeah. that certainly what is there can be reconstructed if it's disturbed and the in the parts of the walls that may need to be rebuilt can be done kind of in kind with what's there, the stones. We'll actually have a surplus of stones um, from what I see because right now the foundation's all stone. And if that comes out with a new foundation, um, well, all those stones well. are available for the project or for the site. And we should have plenty of stones to rebuild those laneway walls with a similar type of just um, stone wall if needed. Well, I'm really pleased to hear that. That's, that, that uh, I'm very happy to hear that you have a salvage recycle mentality with those stones inside uh, uh, either 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 to reuse them specifically or, or to put you know old farms are full of old piles of stone so uh, from my particular personal standpoint seeing a pile of stones added to the pile that's already out behind that equipment shed is adds to the ambience of the place so uh, all right th thanks you've answered all my questions really I appreciate it I'm, and I'm glad you're you're thinking in the salvage mode. All right, uh, George, go ahead. Just, um, just uh, one um, final question and, and things to consider, um, Karen and Jeff, is um, would we be in a position in the fall to um, put in a CPA grant for um, the uh, envelope um, costs so that we can look to funding next spring uh, to keep this project moving? Uh, possibly. Uh, I think it really depends on kind of how this project progresses. We don't, don't have a uh, detailed schedule yet. Uh, we do know that, uh, you know, the, the sheep festival needs to happen if that is allowed and then the clean out of the structure needs to occur. Um, we expect that uh, the contractor will probably want to start this project in July uh, at some point, but we don't have a detailed schedule. And um, you know how much into the fall will the whole project go? It really depends on that schedule that still is to be determined. Um, so it's possible. We'll certainly keep that in mind and look at how things progress as to what the, the next cycle can look like. Thank you. And uh, I guess the, the question for Grace, um, you know, uh, if you're scheduled far out for Old Kings Highway, um, is it possible to um, put uh, an agenda item uh, to be determined in the fall um, or late August, September that um, we can begin discussion on, um, you know, what Jeff just mentioned? Um, when it comes to Old Kings Highway, um, are you talking in like in forms of an informal review or are you looking, I'm, I'm confused of, well, you well you 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 tell um, you know the commission. I'm I'm just looking to see if we have any chance of um, getting something um, uh, in front of the CPC for uh, you know the envelope phase. Karen, um, George, with the the Old Kings Highway question, I think that we need to kind of uh, take off from Jeff's comment, seeing how this project is going. And then we'd have to work up an application. And once we have the application, then we would give it to the Old Kings Highway Committee and it'll get on an agenda. So, mm -hmm. you know, off the top of my head with the scope of work that we're talking about, I'm not sure um, how much additional material we'd need to pull together for, for that. But I, I don't see that as a, as, as a gigantic hurdle. I do think the, the, the question about, you know, the, the internal space is, is probably requires additional conversation. Yeah, and, and I'm not referring to the internal space. It, mm -hmm. it would be moving along with the envelope and making that watertight and, uh, you know, all of the good work we're going to do uh, if it's, you know, the 
bird holes and the mm -hmm. rabbit holes and the squirrel holes, you know, <laughs> if it's op open to the, you know, elements, then um, all the water goes into um, all of Jeff's good work. So, you mm -hmm. know, I think it's important that we, uh, rubber meets the road and, and we got to keep moving forward. Thank Understand. You. I, I did want to let the, the committee know, and I know Jack wanted me to mention this. This was uh, part of the reason we met. Um, we do have a plan. We've met, um, Jeff and I met with um, the association about uh, cleaning out the barn. And because uh, a lot of what's in there needs to come out before the work can start. Um, so we're going to arrange to kind of help with that process. And then in terms of uh, hanging on to things and storing them, we're going to um, take care of getting a container that we could use for storing items temporarily. Uh, what Jack, Grace, and I were discussing yesterday were the bricks, um, which have, have been an ongoing conversation. And we thought short term, we will move the bricks one more time over to the uh, cottage and start um, you know, assessing the, the brick situation. Um, we will also hang on to the timbers until we um, uh, know we don't need them, uh, either for this project or for the Baxter Grismo. But we're, we're planning ahead, so. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, I think uh, we're pretty much wrapping up. Um, we just have one note here that the annual town meeting is on May 2nd. Um, and I, I think I'll depart. Uh, yeah, thank thank you, you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have confirmation that the um, the owners of the River Street property can meet us on the 27th? And we were talking about that, Grace. Yes, I've had a discussion with them and they are prepared um, for the fourth Thursday to, to meet with us. OK, so we will have an additional meeting on May 27th um, to discuss the River Street is it number 10? Is that what it is? 10? River Street. Um, and there was one other thing you were going to put on the agenda for that meeting as well, wasn't there? Um, I There's a few things. I'm just working out what would be best, um, what makes sense for us. But yeah, for regulatory review, it's 115 River Street that will be reviewed. Um, that's the one that we had in the fall, yep. which is right um, right there, right on the coastal bank of Bass River, but they've come with revised plans um, yeah. and I will be distributing them so everybody can review them. Okay, perfect. Um, so that will be an additional meeting we'll have this month and then our next regular meeting will be June 10th. Um, does anybody have anything else before we adjourn? Jack, go ahead. Uh, you're good, you're unmuted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, I had asked to put on this uh, uh, meeting schedule a request that came to me because of, uh, I guess, because I, I have a sort of a profile of sort in the world of archaeology. Uh, the request uh, that came in here, and I passed it on to Julie, George, uh, Karen, and uh, Grace to, to talk about at this meeting. And I, I really I apologize for lengthening of this, but I, I think I need, I would like very much to get a response and an answer from the commission. Yeah, the, Woods Hole, the Woods Hole Museum uh, approached me with a request to uh, for a loan of about a half a dozen uh, archaeological artifacts with a Yarmouth connection. The reason they asked this is they're putting together a Cape-wide archaeology exhibit uh, uh, that focuses on the pre-colonial past of, of the area. And they're working with Public Archaeology Lab. They've identified a half a dozen sites from one end of the Cape to the other. And one of the sites is in Yarmouth out at Great Island, which is a very unusual um, uh, archaeological find uh, uh, related to Native American agricultural practices and evidence. And what they were looking for was um, a loan of artifacts that are connected to this, either this and or the West Yarmouth area and or the kind of activity that uh, took place out there to, to go as part of their exhibit. And uh, I've talked uh, uh, in person and via email with uh, one of the people organizing this display. I think they'd be satisfied with 
like I said, a half a dozen artifacts, all of which I, I believe uh, are in the case of Town Hall right now. They would be some of the West Yarmouth points uh, uh, that were donated to the town and, uh, and the grindstone that was found at uh, Taylor Bray Farm. So that's the request. Uh, uh, Grace asked some questions uh, with respect to this when I sent in the, the ask to discuss it this morning uh, related to loans, uh, museum loans and artifacts, MHC. Uh, but this is what we have before us. I think I very much would like to answer the Woods Hole people in a timely fashion. Either they're going to know they're going to get something on loan from us or they're not. And I don't want to wait for the next meeting to get, uh, to get an answer back for them. They've got some planning to do. I think this is a good opportunity to uh, enhance the message they're sending about the town's archaeological pre-colonial past. Uh, but there's the proposal, Julie, Karen, Grace, take it from there. Yeah, yeah I, I saw that as well. Um, I mean, is there anything, any reason why we wouldn't be able to do that, Grace or Karen? You're muted, Karen. I'm going to be honest, I have not had a chance to read what you sent, Jack. Um, I'm going to try to pull it up right now. Uh, it's from it uh, Wednesday, the 10th. Uh, Grace, okay. while Karen's reading, um, comments, please. Uh, my general concern is just um, the way that we package um, artifact loans out. Um, there's typically a lot that goes into that. Um, I express my concerns to Jack upon having a contract, contractual agreement, some sort of a, uh, identification perhaps in there, a visual inventory guide, because just because you loan something out, you wanna make sure that it's coming back to you the same way that you want it. Um, a handling procedure, things of that matter. Um, it, it might seem overboard, but I mean, cataloging a exhibit is it's typical, that's professional practice. Um, that's something that, again, I have a background in, I know how to do it. Um, but that's just my, my main concern. As far as what we can do, I'm not familiar if, I mean, Jack obviously has experience because we've learned it out before, but I, I'm assuming that there wouldn't be an issue with the state or anything of that matter, considering we've done it before. Yes. Beverly? I am concerned as well, based on the problems we had with that uh, storage of stuff that we've got for Great Island and that we, never saw her again. Um, I'm concerned about things going out and coming back. And I totally agree with, you know, we need to, you know, get a uh, catalog together, know exactly what we're sending and how we're getting it there and how it's getting back to us. I, I, can, I can answer some of that if, if, if you want me to do that right now. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, the, uh, uh, Chris Poloni is the fellow I've been dealing with at uh, Woods Hole Museum. They have a, a, a standard loan agreement uh, in which we can, uh, I've not seen a copy of it yet, uh, but we can easily, for a half a dozen items, uh, creating the kind of catalog that uh, Grace is talking about, both uh, uh, narrative descriptive terms of what we, were, we would loan, uh, as well as uh, visual, taking the, take visual, taking pictures of it. Uh, that's easy enough, I could accomplish that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll need some help from George because uh, we, we'd have to go into uh, the display case at Town Hall. And uh, if this is approved, we would remove the items uh, uh, and just replace them with a little card that says uh, out on loan to Woods Hole Museum. Uh, they would want these loans, uh, Bev, to get to your point. Uh, it, uh, uh, they would want the items on loan for a very specific period of time, uh, June to September, I've had a little bit on either end for administrative processing, but uh, uh, that's the, so there's a time frame. There's a, a specific number of items. Uh, I did discuss with Chris how much space they would have and how they would label them at their exhibit. Um, 
So specific time, specific amount, and um, uh, I could easily, uh, uh, like I said, with George's help to take them out of the case uh, to do the uh, photography and the uh, and an inventory to go with the agreement that Woods Hole uses. Uh, and I'll, I'll drive them over and I'll drive them back. I'm, I'm available if you need me to volunteer. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, as long as you two work together to get them photographed and cataloged and maybe Grace can help and make sure that it's all done properly and then the agreement's all filled out. And I think it sounds like a good idea. George, go ahead. Um, Julie, that, that sounded like a motion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will second it. I'll, I'll make that motion. There you go. <laughs> and I will second it. Second. And make it subject to, um, you know, Grace's uh, review of the documentation and make sure that we, um, you know, before we send anything out that we're buttoned up, um, you know, from a town standpoint and from her um, historical uh, safety measures. Yeah. And I would also just add that make sure it, it lists the, the dates you know, the Absolutely. time frame that they will be absent from our, our area. Um, Absolutely. Okay, so there's my motion, Jack, George seconded. Jack, did you want to add before? I, I just, I just want, I want to make sure, George, you okay with uh, two, two things. One, George, are you okay with the two of us going into the town hall and taking the stuff out? And, and the, the larger question goes to Karen and Grace, I guess. Uh, can we come into town hall and do this? And what are we, what's the requirement for us to do that? At, you know, masks, I assume, that when, kind of thing. When do you want to come in? George, you, George and I can work out a date. I, Just I'll call us and we'll, we'll make arrangements. Okay. And, and, and wear I'm, a mask. I'm vaccinated. I'm safe. Me too. No, that's, that's great. But I th we still have the, um, so right now, Grace and I don't have our masks on because we're alone in our offices. When I go down the hall or I go out just to the outside of my office, we mask up. So make Absolutely. sure you bring them in. No full hazmat suits and booties. No. Uh, maybe just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Bob? Bob? Yeah, just one, one quick thing. Just um, so great. Do we have any existing procedures to for loaning? <laughs> so basically we're going to create um, standard operating procedure for this as okay. far as i know yes <laughs> okay okay sounds good all right um, um, i'm gonna roll call for approval uh i made the motion george seconded uh jack aye kathy aye bob kelly aye beverly aye and bob highslip aye okay motion passed george thank and jack. you all but I want to see Jack in the booties. I think that's a <laughs> nice touch. I used to, uh, I was a regular visitor out at Los Alamos and uh, Livermore. So I'm, uh, and, and the New Mexico test site. I'm well familiar with all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> hey, I want to do one last thing. It'll take 30 seconds. And I want to brag on this. And uh, I've completed phase one of my Revolutionary War Veterans Project. Wow. It, it's a 129 page annotated list of uh, approximately 275 uh, uh, men who served in uh, uh, either the militia and or the Continental Army between 1775 and 1783. And, uh, First phase is completed. Uh, uh, it, it whittled down from an original about 350 names to the approximately 275 I have now because uh, of, of double double bookkeeping and uh, uh, multiple uh, name spelling variations, whatever. But uh, this is the uh, the end of the beginning. Wow. The, the next step is to. Uh, continue working with Historical Society. Duncan and I have been in pretty much lockstep. Uh, I do the work and he reviews it. <laughs> uh, but we're, the next step is coordination. Uh, uh, 
Melanie will know what I'm going to do next, and I'm going to reach out to uh, David Schaefer, who's been part of the uh, the Gravestone Restoration Project. And uh, Duncan, David, and I have talked in the past. David is is more than just the this guy working on the gravestones. He's also gotten interested in a lot of the history of the people who lie beneath those gravestones and has developed on his own uh, additional information beyond the source material I used in the soldiers and sailors volumes. So I believe based on our earlier meetings last fall, he can add to this, but here we are folks, uh, pretty good. And it's the first time anybody's done this, which surprised the hell out of me when Duncan said nobody had done it before. So that's, I guess, I guess that's a minute more than 30 seconds, but what the hell, it's eight years. <laughs> Congratulations. Here's, here's the sound. <laughs> Pretty weighty. Can you weigh it? <laughs> I think it probably weighs about three quarters of a pound here. Oh, 129 yeah. pages. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm happy. All right, so we're going to adjourn. We'll see everybody on May 27th for the River Street Review and then regular meeting on June 10th. Um, I'm gonna make unless, unless we see you at town meeting on yes. May 22nd at nine o'clock in the morning at the Mattachese Middle School on the ball field. Oh, okay. There Play ball. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Can I have a second? Second. second. Okay. <laughs> Everybody just seconded. So um, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure who is second. We'll say George seconded that one. Uh, Jack. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Bob. Yep. Beverly. Hi. And Bob. Bye. All right, everybody. Thank you. We'll uh, see you in a couple weeks. Thank you. Great meeting. Bye. Bye. So long.